Welcome to the sixth episode of Kung Fu Conversations in our interview sections with the ever popular William Wayne Williams, also known as Will from Monkey Stills Peach, also known as the poor guy that gets beat up in all of his videos. God bless you for it, <laughs> Will. Uh, the, the international punching bag, Will Williams from Monkey Stills Peach. Will, thanks for being here today, man. Thank you for taking the time to, to interview me. Appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, thank you. Absolutely. So I might as well start. I'm going to start with the first question. So when we release this, Will, I think your whole Taiwan series will be out, including the Kung Fu and the culture and the people. For the month that you spent, the month and a half in Taiwan, could you just give our audience what you felt of the people, the scenery, everything, the food, the culture? Could you give us kind of a general general statement of what that journey was like? Yeah, sure. Um, let me just think where to start. Well, first of all, I wasn't there for a month and a half. I was only there for two weeks. So what oh, okay. I do is I, I usually, I film all of the interviews in one sort of block and then I edit like after I've already left and gone home. So I, I release it a lot slower than, you know, the actual treasure. Gotcha. Um, but still, yeah. Um, Taiwan is somewhere that I've wanted to go to for a really long time. I mean, obviously living in China for, 13 years and then Ch Taiwan being the sort of so-called other China, I guess you could say, um, you know, I wanted to see how similar or how different things were. So it was really, really interesting for me. Um, I think sort of the biggest first impression I got, and I already talked about this on a video that I did on my second channel was just how polite the people were. I mean, they were so polite and sort of very, I'd say it's a bit of a Japanese influence in the culture there, maybe because it was colonized by Japan for, I think it was 50 or a hundred years. I'm not too sure on the history there, but um, yeah, it reminded me a lot of kind of how I picture Japan and very sort of rigid following of the rules. Like, you know, when there's a red light, but there's absolutely no traffic, people still won't cross, you know, they'll just stand mm. there. If, if you do cross, you kind of look like an asshole. Um, it, was the same with masks. <laughs> it, it, it was the same with masks. Like they, they'd removed the mask mandate, but everybody everywhere was still wearing a mask. Mm. Um, and that was a bit awkward for filming because obviously it muffles sound quality. So I had to tell people, look, you can't wear a mask when we're filming. Otherwise it's just not going to work. Some people are a bit kind of hesitant about that, but uh, we got there and we made it happen. Um, so yeah, that was, you know, kind of interesting because, you know, that sort of, uh, very formal, very polite culture is quite different to China, which is quite a kind of chaotic place. Uh, so that was, I guess, kind of my biggest takeaway. So any of the food besides the snake pile? really stand out, <laughs> <laughs> really stand out that uh, you find fascinating or different? Um, the food I found quite, I want to say really stood out. Like, I'm sorry if there's any like real foodies here watching, like <laughs> listening to this and being like, oh my God, you went to Taiwan and you didn't try this or you didn't try that. But um, overall, it, it was quite sort of simple stuff. Like there was a lot of like uh, ribs and rice. Um, there was obviously with Taiwan being so small, I don't think there's, you know, such the kind of variety that you get in China, which is such a big place. Mm -hmm. um, so I wouldn't say food was really a standout thing for me there, but then again, that may have just been down to like limited time and, you know, trying to focusing more on just, you know, trying to cram in all these interviews in such a short period and not really being able to take the time to go out and explore. Mm -hmm. So were you able to like go north and south on the island? No, I was just in Taipei. Um, okay. I decided like, yeah. originally I really wanted to go down to the south, but mm -hmm. just, you know, with the amount of interviews that I'd arranged and the short time frame that I was there, I thought, look, it's better just to focus on Taipei for this trip and then do like a second trip where I just focus on the south and do two whole series. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's great. That was, and I was just going to ask you that. Yeah. Are you going to go back again? So it sounds like that's part of the, 
the whole consensus it is, is. But not sure when. Maybe later this year, maybe next year. Not not really sure right now, but definitely mm-hmm. that's on the cards. And if I did a Southern series, it would be pretty much focusing on Southern styles because that's more what's down in like Tainan and Kaohsiung and that sort of area. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. No, so, no, no. okay. So our, our Mantis crew, you got to work with some very different Mantis practitioners. As a Mantis guy yourself, what did you think of everybody? Because I will tell you, at some point, I'm going to ask you specifically, the two that really stood out for me were <laughs> the six harmonies gentlemen mm. and the eight step guy. I really, you know, I loved everyone that you interviewed. I loved, uh, the mm-hmm. Wutan guys. You know, that was super cool to see those guys. Uh, the, ju- the guys that do the Mantis long fist, which do long fist and mm. the, uh, is it, is it Mehua Mantis that they yeah, do yeah, also yeah, there? Yeah. Uh, I liked the other long fist cat. I want to get into him in a little bit. But the two gentlemen, to me at least, that really stood out were the gentleman that did eight step and the gentleman that did six step. Before I get into the questions specifically with those two cats, what did you think of the Mantis guys? Because I'm going to tell you, watching most of your videos, which I have and I love, thank you so much for putting out such great quality videos. Mm-hmm. I will say that I I thought that they were kind of partial to you, not just because they beat you up. But because you were a Mantis guy, and I really felt that every Mantis camp that you met or teacher that you met in Taiwan really were open on things that I've never really seen a whole lot of other people be open with. Could you talk a little bit about that, Will? Yeah, I guess that's probably just because I'm a Mantis guy, so I kind of knew what I wanted to know from them. Um you know, the long fist mantis, I mean, I've known John for quite a few years. Well, what are we, 2023? I'd say probably almost eight to 10 years, you know, known him online. So, you know, we've had that ongoing connection. We've shared a lot of stuff online. Um, so, you know, naturally, you know, they were going to be quite open because of that connection. Um, and that style is the closest to my own style. I mean, I know it's called long mm. fist mantis, but... Essentially, as, as I explained, it's, it's actually because they're teaching long fist and mantis. The thing is in Taiwan, um, under the sort of, the, I think it was in like the fifties and sixties, sort of not long after the Guomindang government fled to Taiwan, um, they created this policy where only one, like every school had to register, every martial arts school had to register with the government, but only one, uh, only one school could represent one style. So mm. some us, and I, I don't know who, had already taken the name Meihua Plum Blossom Mantis. So Gao Dao Sheng was like, well, someone else has already claimed the name. I do Long Fist, I do Mantis, why don't I just call it Long Fist Mantis? Right. Um, so that was that. Um, but yeah, I mean, style-wise, it, it's definitely the closest... Uh, to what I do, they they focus a lot more on chinna, like you know, locking and locking mm-hmm. and, and joint manipulation. They also do a lot more like of the sweeps and things like that. Um, so that was quite cool to see. Um, eight step mantis. I mean, as the guy said in the interview, the only difference really is the forms that they do. And the, uh, I mean, he kept saying that like the the power generation was very different, but. Mm-hmm. I still don't really think so, ultimately. I mean, you could say a bit softer than us, a bit more whippy. But overall, it's still that same sort of full-body power generation. Um, but that was was very cool. I enjoyed, you know, his hand techniques. And he was very heavy-handed, which I liked. Mm-hmm. Uh, actually, John said to me before, he's like, oh, you're going to go see Jiang Junhao. Uh, yeah, you better, you know, just be aware that he's like really, really heavy-handed with people. And I was like, oh, yeah, that's fine. You know, don't worry. I like it. It looks better on camera. <laughs> I, was, I sort of went in there like expecting it, but I wasn't ready for just like how hard he was going to hit me with that shoulder. Mm-hmm. Oh, I, yeah, I remember yeah. that when they put you on the ground. I was like, good <laughs> Lord, man. He's fully good Lord, man. Out of me there. Yeah. Um, and, and then what else? The, uh, the six harmony mantis. Um, yeah, he was a little bit more reserved, so we didn't get quite so mm-hmm. much footage, but that was interesting for me because 
that is the one style of mantis that's very different to other styles. So, um, you know, that was cool to actually finally see some. I mean, back in China, I'd met a lot of Six Harmony Mantis people, but I'd not really like gone and trained with them or really asked them stuff. I just sort of, you know, at these, these big, uh, drinking banquet thingies that they like to do in China, you know, you always sat around a big table and because obviously they're all, you know, they're all friends and they all know each other. So I'd met a lot of these guys, you know, drinking, but not, uh, training. I was impressed by how much of a smooth mover the Six Harmonies cat was. I mean, they're all smooth movers. All mm. of them have great forms. I love watching all of them, but there was a quality to his movement that was very fascinating to watch. And I, I really enjoyed watching him do the forms. And you guys got great footage of that too. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Like I say, um, it's very different way of moving, I think, to all the other styles of Mantis. Hmm. What do you think? More... Uh, so, sorry. What were you going to say? No, no, no. I was just going to ask. So what oh, I, what do you think are the, the differences in terms of the influences on that style that really give it that quality? I think the big thing is most styles of Mantis tend to revolve around sort of like a horizontal rotation to generate power. Mm. You know, you're, mm-hmm. you're, you're using the hips, the shoulders, and you're, you're getting it through, you know, hence why we're called Taiji, right? Yin and Yang. It's that sort of back and forth interplay. Um, and, you know, seven star and eight step and everything. They're all essentially mostly using this horizontal. There is vertical movement as well, but not as much. Mm-hmm. Whereas six harmony mantis is very much vertical power. It, it, it's mm. like a circle going this way, you know, like a wave coming through the spine, mm-hmm. which could be a, like a Tongbei influence or a, a Shingy influence. Shingy. You know? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Wow. Yeah. I, I loved watching him move. I'm like that, that is a different look in Mantis over there. Very much yeah. so. So I'm yeah, actually really hoping cool to, see. to, I'm hoping to go and visit a six harmony Mantis guy here in Australia, down in Melbourne, mm. uh, Beijing. His name's Gao Jian. Uh, he's very good. Uh, so I'm hoping to go down and, and see him possibly in July. Um, and I think we'll be able to delve a little bit deeper there. Mm-hmm. Find out a Very little bit more about what Six Harmony is all about. Awesome. Awesome. And, and maybe one of our last uh, gentlemen that I really thought stood out. Ev- everything st- stands out because I, I love watching your stuff. But the gentleman with all the toys that yeah, <laughs> a- accidentally mm-hmm. dropped his bell on his wood floor. I'm like, oh, no, Will. I, I, I felt bad. But like he had some great training tools. And I think one of the little messages that he said was, he's like, yes, we're Kung Fu, but we have ways to train the body. And I thought that was really special and really kind of cool. You know, he had that really big long pole for, to mimic the spear. He had the stone locks and just all kinds of cool stuff there. And, um, do you specifically in your Tai Chi Mantis, do you guys have anything like that that you kind of focus on that kind of adds to your uh, empty hand training? Um, stone lock training. Um, we do have the large spear as well, but with sort of more limited space, in, you know, it's not that practical to, to I haven't really trained it that much because of that. Mm-hmm. And, you know, actually kind of little side note, because my teacher used to live on the sixth floor. So when he would bring it out to train, because it's so big, you couldn't get it down, like out his door and down the stairs, he would just lower it out the window. <laughs> that's a hell so, yeah, of a long imagine, spear. It wasn't the most practical thing for training, so we didn't get to do that much of it. But yes, it is a part of Taiji Mansons. Okay. Uh, stone locks, um, also just like holding bricks and, mm-hmm. and, and when you're doing your stances and basics, because, um, you know, one of the things with holding a brick, you know, versus just like holding a weight or a wristband is because it's an awkward shape, it's sort of, it trains your grip strength as well because it sort of stretches out your fingers as well. It's quite awkward. Mm. Mm. So, you know, we do a fair bit of that. Um, my teacher's always just been quite into, you know, just getting me to, re- you know, just regularly lifting weights, um, you know, doing lots of pull-ups and push-ups and body weight stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, where we used to train, there was a lot of trees around and they used to, fix like uh, wooden bars between the trees so they used to you know, he always used to get us doing a lot of pull-ups and one-armed pull-ups and, and things like that 
So in your system, do you have, um, I'm sure you have weapons. Uh, what, what have you, did you practice any of those, those weapons or, you know, what kinds do you have? Yeah, we have the main weapons. Um, so broadsword or saber, you know, the dal, um, spear, uh, my teacher himself, he doesn't actually practice a regular staff. Um, he, he just practices the Bien Gan, the short stick, which isn't actually a mantis thing. He learns it from, uh, a guy from Northwestern China, but he just mm. likes it. So just, you know, he kind of added that in himself. Um, and then the double handed sword, which is kind of the you mm. know, quintessential classic. Mantis. Weapon. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Speaking of, um, you would be a good person to ask this. Hopefully, do you know when you might get back to the mainland or? Anything like that, um, or when they're going to open well, up? Knock, knock all on wood. The kind of excessive COVID stuff in China is looks like it's over now. So at some point, I don't have any plan just yet. My next plan is to go to Hong Kong. Mm. Um, haven't settled on a date for when I'm going to go to Hong Kong yet, but that is the next plan. China, yeah, I don't know. Um, it's just with it being such a big place, you kind of need to go for a lot longer as well. Sure. And there's a lot more, and, and there's a lot more logistics involved. You've got to get a visa. Um, you know, it's a little bit more restrictive on, on moving around because there's only certain hotels that foreigners can stay in mm-hmm. now and things like that. So it needs a lot more planning. You know, other places are a lot easier. You can just kind of rock up and get a stamp on entry and just kind of wing it. Mm-hmm. Any plans to move anywhere else in the world, Will? Um, no, I'm pretty happy in Australia. I, good. Um, and it, it's close enough that I can still do all these trips to Asia. I mean, it's like, what, six-hour flight to sort of most parts of Southeast Asia. Mm. Um, Taiwan was only seven hours. I think China's about the same. So, Oh, that's um, not bad. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Awesome. So, I mean, I, I've kind of done my, done my time yeah. out in sticks in the middle of nowhere in China for 13 years. So are you saying that toilets and running water are not overrated, my friend? <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. You heard it here first, folks. So <laughs> I guess one of my big questions for you, and I, I kind of talked about this as I harass you over Instagram and the internet and whatnot. Um, hopefully not too much. You've stepped in the world into the world of Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. Mm. You've been at it for what, almost a year now or two? What are we, April? I think yes, it's like just been a year. Yeah. I think it's exactly okay. a year since I started. How has that changed? Maybe not so much your view on Chinese martial arts, but like training overall in general of what you feel like practice and training should be. Has it given you any ideas as? a practitioner of a different art or style and even maybe as a coach, because you seem to be very fond of your Brazilian Jiu Jitsu coaches and they seem to be really good practitioners as well. Could you give us any insight into that, sir? Yeah. Um, my Jiu Jitsu teacher, Giorgio, he's actually a Mantis student of Brendan Tunks. <laughs> so that's okay. how I got that's, to know him. And he's uh, actually done Mantis longer than me. He's done it since I think you like before the year 2000, I think <laughs> he's actually done Mantis longer than he's done jujitsu as well, but he just got more into the jujitsu. Um, yeah, I think, look, honestly, if I'd have maybe just rocked up to one of those like big kind of, you know, Gracie franchise gyms, I might not have got into it so much, but I think mm. it's just because of Giorgio's, his outlook and his approach. I mean, he's very old school. He's a very artistic kind of creative guy. He's, re- he's, he's South American. He's really into music and um, yeah, I th- he's got a very old school approach to jujitsu and obviously doing the Kung Fu as well. So I think he kind of helped me to sort of, uh, I don't know, how can I say he sort of helped me to get into it and, 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 I think it was just his, his way of doing it is kind of what got me hooked and his way of teaching jujitsu. I actually find is quite similar to uh, the Chinese way of teaching martial arts as well. He's Mm. quite eclectic and quite, um, you know, he's very, 
he goes very, very deep into the principles of movement and things. So mm. it kind of resonated a lot with my Chinese martial art background. That is so cool. That is so cool. And you got lucky there too. It sounds like you had maybe what you you had like some preconceived notions, but because he had that mantis background, he's like, come on in, give it a mm. shot, see if this, this kind of works for you. Have you tried some of the, the kickboxing and things like that as well there? Cause it, uh, is it a full MMA gym or is it uh, just? So, yeah. So, um, the owner of the gym, Christian, he, he's actually the head of Shidakan Karate Australia. So Shidakan mm. is kind of an offshoot of Gokushin. So it's like a full contact karate style, but the difference is uh, it's got grappling in it as well. Mm. Oh, wow. So the curriculum is kind of focused between the, the Shidakan Karate, the Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, um, and then kickboxing. Uh, so I, I, I sometimes do the kickboxing as well. I've been to a few karate classes. I do like the full contact sparring. I like the not using gloves um, and, and hitting to the body. It's, it's a good way to spar. Um, but Honestly, I've got like so many forms in my head from, from my time in China mm. that I want to learn the karate because you got to learn yep. all the kata as well. Right. Uh, but sometimes, yeah, I do the kickboxing sort of on and off, but mostly focusing on the jujitsu. Very good. Very good. Do you, would you, would you subscribe or suggest that to some of our other Chinese Kung Fu practitioners out there? Do you think that that's something that maybe they should look into or maybe they have to kind of do that on their own to find the right teacher or, you know, could it open up some ideas to them about their own training? I guess is maybe what I'm saying. What would you say to that? Yeah, look, I think there's a couple of ways I would say to go about this. One would be um, if you wanted to get into Chinese martial arts, I think it would be a, a good idea. And this is something that I can say with hindsight is that I wish maybe I'd have done some kind of combat sports before I started Chinese martial arts, just so that it's like, you know, I know how to punch and kick. I know how to block. I'm, I'm used to taking punches to the head and whatever. You kind of get it out of the way. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that's kind of maybe one approach. The other way would be, after you've done traditional martial arts for quite a long time to then go into it. I just think when you're trying to do two things at the same time, your attention's yep. too divided mm-hmm. and it's hard to get good at one thing. Agreed. Agreed. So do you find, uh, and you know, in all of your travels and, and, uh, interviews and, and whatnot, any, is, is it common to find schools that practice in some kind of full contact or some, some sort of, you know, like sparring training and things like that. Is that, is, is that been common or is it more uncommon or? I think generally in Asia, I wouldn't say just in China, but most places I've been in Asia, there isn't a huge amount of that training. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think there's kind of historical social reasons for that. Sure. Um, I mean, if we're just looking at Chinese martial arts, I won't talk about other traditional martial arts, but just Chinese martial arts, you know, coming into the 20th century as they were sort of reformed and there was an attempt at standardizing them, mm-hmm. they, it became more about cultivating a sense of Chineseness, as in like, you know, I'm a Chinese person and practicing this makes me feel more Chinese. And I suppose that is kind of similar to what the Japanese were trying to do with Budo and the Koreans did with things like Taekwondo. There was... Mm-hmm quite a sort of sense of nationalism about practicing martial arts. Right. I don't think it was really like, honestly, I don't think that the main reason for people training, it was to be like the best fighter in the world. Mm -hmm. I think because of that, it's, and the way that's kind of evolved that mindset, um, it, it, it sort of, people have been practicing it for, you know, for those reasons, and then when you look at most places in Asia, there's quite a low level of violent crime. I mean, mm. most places I've been, maybe apart from the Philippines, you know, there's a lot of crime in the Philippines, but most places that I've been in, in, you know, China, Taiwan, Southeast Asia, South Korea, it's pretty safe. So you, you're not really worrying too much about having to defend yourself. And so 
people don't really have this mentality of like, well, I need to be a really good fighter. It's more about that social cultural thing of, you know, feeling a connection to your heritage as well mm-hmm. as you know, a connection to the past and knowing that this art came from these masters in the old days. Mm-hmm. And also about the social aspect, you know, having a, a group of people that you can kind of get together with and you can rely on them. That's a very mm-hmm. big thing I saw in China is that people also use martial arts sort of like as a networking thing, you know, right. like so if his master's quite well known and one of his students is a government official, maybe the guy who runs the docks or something. And then you're someone who wants to start an import export business, you know, and now you know him through martial arts. So he's going to, you know, you've got that kind of inroad there. Right. So I see a lot of people using it as a, you know, for the social kind of thing. Mm-hmm. That's fascinating. That's fascinating. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I remember, uh, when our, when our little group started, I started Wing Chun in college and it was called a club. And I remember like a lot of the Hong Kong groups, you know, it's like an athletic club or things yeah, like that. Exactly. If you look back exactly. and they tran- translated into English, it's like this club and that club and that group mentality of having, you know, camaraderie and people to go to and train with is pretty cool too. Would yeah, you say, exactly. would you say, Will, uh, going along with that, that it's fascinating because it sounds like clubs could be a place where like if there was a caste system that was set aside, it's like you could be a lawyer, you could be a doctor, you could be a cook, you could be a a cab driver and together you're still training and kind of like that brotherhood. Yeah, very much. I mean, you know, like, like I say, you know, there's people from sort of all, all kinds of, you know, sorry, I'm just, sorry. Can we just pause one sec? Sure. Sure. Well, just move to the bedroom. So I'm just going to move because we're cooking here and it might get a bit noisy. Oh. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Sorry. You can You're good. No problem. Cut that bit out. <laughs> um, Sorry. What was I saying? Yeah. So like one of the things with, you know, with the martial arts is that, yeah, like, you know, you've got people from all different parts of society. Like I say, you know, when I was training with my teacher, we had some people that were, you know, communist party officials, some that were like rich businessmen, some that were just like, you know, we had a couple of cab drivers, a couple of chefs, you know, it's all, all kinds of different people. Um, and then you sort of put that aside and you just, you know, you just train together. That's awesome. I'm the weirdo in our group. I'm the bus driver. <laughs> And I think just um, to sort of go back to the original, uh, you know, the question about the difference with the jiu-jitsu and modern martial arts, I think that is kind of one of the things that people forget. You know, I see a lot of comments on, on, on the channel of people like, oh, you know, these guys aren't sparring. Why aren't they sparring or whatever? But it's like not everybody trains for that reason. You know, not mm-hmm. everybody has this mentality of I need to be the hardest guy in the world, you know? People mm-hmm. get a lot of, a lot of enjoyment from practicing for different reasons. And, you know, honestly, even like at my jujitsu class and the kickboxing and stuff, you know, most of these guys, like, cause our, our gym is right in the CBD. Most of these guys are like lawyers and accountants and office workers and stuff. And, you know, they're not trying to be like, you know, the next champion of the UFC or something. It's, it's just people that are, practicing for the enjoyment of practicing. And mm-hmm. I think traditional martial arts is, is the same thing. People practice just for the intrinsic, um, you know, ben- the, the sort of intrinsic enjoyment of it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I was going to ask you, you know, um, so do you, are you, have you been teaching? Do you, do you have a group that you teach currently or? Um, I haven't like properly set up a group. It's kind of something that has been on my mind a bit, but at the same time, it's like a lot of advertising and, and Mm -hmm. because like most of the people that follow my channel are actually in like the U S Canada, Europe. It's not such a big Australian audience actually getting in people that are in Sydney. It's yeah. Mm. So I haven't really kind of gone through with anything. I have one student here in Sydney that I teach privately. Uh, He's Mm -hmm. been training with me for about three years. And then I have uh, a couple of people that I teach online um, in the U S as well that have been Mm -hmm. both training a couple of years. That's cool. 
one of my favorite videos. This is going back in your repertoire. And if you could talk about this just a little bit more, I know you mentioned it in the video. Uh, you might even remember the title of it. I can't remember of it, the title of it, but you actually went to one of, was it the universities over in China and studied for a year? Will? is that right? Am I- um, you talking about, Martial arts or Chinese here? Martial martial arts, like like, didn't oh. you go to a university for a year? Was it, and then you learned the? Oh, it, it, it wasn't a university. It was just like a like a full time live in uh, martial arts academy. Hmm. Could, could you could you just go over that just again? Because I thought that was fascinating. Because at least before COVID and the whole world shut down and everything transitioned, I find that a lot of Westerners are going over to Shaolin and studying or Wudan and studying yeah. or, you know, some of the universities are outside of those temples and they'll learn a lot of forms and the forms will be awesome. But anytime they do combat, it's Sanda. And that's exactly what we did. Yeah. Yeah. That was okay. exactly. What, what do you, what is the disconnect that's happened um, between? So what they're doing is it, it's sort of, these academies are sort of based on that modern Shaolin approach, which is they've sort of put things into separate categories. So, you know, forms are a category. And then within that, they've got traditional forms and modern performance forms. So, mm. you know, they, they're practicing all of the like Tong Bei Chen and Xiao Hong Chen, Da Hong Chen, all of those old, genuine old Shaolin forms. They're practicing them. Um, and then they're doing like these modern wushu forms like tiger and eagle and, you know, drunken boxing and whatever. But then um, they're doing the the sanda, like Chinese kickboxing, as a completely separate thing. And there is no connection. There's there's nothing, you know, other than like, you know, using your whole body to generate power and stuff. There, there's no real tangible uh, connection between the two. Hmm. But I still think it, it's a good experience, like, to go through and the reason that I decided to go there was because China is quite difficult to navigate as an outsider and it's, you know, everything's sort of built on, on social connections. So it's hard to find these genuine masters as an outsider. So I felt like that would be the best way that I'd be able to um, like get some really serious training um, cause I'd been going around the parks in Qingdao and just trying to meet people by myself, but it was, you know, it was difficult. So, um, it does give you a very good foundation. I mean, you know, doing any physical activity for like eight hours a day, five days a week, right? And, right. You know, doing all those forms, putting the, 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 the basic stances, the basic movements down, learning how to coordinate and move the body. Plus we did a lot of sanda. Um, typically we do, it's not, I wouldn't call it like competition, but they'd have these inter, intergroup, uh, full contact sparring matches every, every two weeks or every month or so. Mm. Um, so you'd be sort of like unofficially competing with people that were training in other groups. Sort of, yeah, every, every couple of weeks or every month, depending on how often they held them. So, you know, you, you learn how to fight, you learn how to mm-hmm. kickbox, you learn how to move. So I think it gives you a good foundation for which to then go off and, and look for more serious and traditional masters. And, and how did the you find it? Is, Go ahead. Yeah. 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 Go ahead. Sorry. I'll just, yeah, I'll just finish. The downside of it is, um, there are people that sort of think that that's the be all and end all. And that is traditional Chinese martial arts. And they go there for a period, they learn it and then they come back to the West and they open up a school And then there's sort of, it perpetuates this kind of misunderstanding that there's no connection between the forms and the fighting. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. So was that where you found, how did you find your Tai Chi Mantis teacher? Was it because did you have a letter of introduction or did somebody through a friend of Uh, a friend? No, it was just because that academy was in the mountains just outside of the Yantai. And I was actually learning Mantis there. I wasn't learning Shaolin. Like I say, when we had different groups, um, so there was like the Shaolin group. There was two Shaolin groups that were taught by Shaolin monks. 
Um, there was a mantis, uh, and there was a badgie tran. Um, so I did mantis and, um, my teacher was sort of a younger guy as far as masters go. He was in his, in his forties, maybe late thirties or early forties. Um, so I just kind of, after a while, I was like, okay, well, who, who are the people that like these teachers are learning from? Why don't I go straight to the source? So, um, when I finished up my year at the academy, I uh, moved to, into the city, to Yantai city itself. And, um, I'd come to know that there, that there was this list made by the Chinese martial art association called the 10 famous masters of Yantai. They typically do them for every city. Mm. Um, so I kind of went through this list and I just, you know, okay, so who are the Mantis guys on the list? I think there was like six or so of them. Um, and I just found where they were teaching and I just rocked up and I was like, hi, I know Mantis. <laughs> They're like, let's see, <laughs> let's see it, kid. Let's see it, kid. Oh my and I goodness. just, uh, you know, I just sort of got chatting with them and just sort of asked them a bit about their style, sort of, you know, took an interest in it and, and just kind of from going through a few different ones, I just realized that Joe Jen Dong was the, the teacher that you know, resonated me with the most. I mean, his, his personality, his approach, his, his style. And I, I sort of knew a little bit about the old manuscripts and the old mantis, not a whole lot, but I knew enough that when he started to talk, I knew that what he was saying was really like the old stuff, you know, and he, mm. he understood you know, it was the same sort of terminology and he was able to explain these, these phrases and things that I, I'd heard about, but didn't know mm-hmm. what they meant. Mm. About awesome. how, how far into your training were you with your Tai Chi Mantis teacher where you were like, wow, this is not the form and Sanda base. Cause I mean, there, I mean, when, when you start to have a teacher that shows you these are not just you know, forms, but you know, their principles or drills or two man sets or setups or, you know, all these different things that these complex forms can be. If you, if you tear them apart and you eat them in tiny pieces, where was it? Was it right away? Was it the first day? Was it a few months into it? Pretty a year much into straight it? away. Yeah. Really? Pretty straight away. Yeah. I mean, he, he asked me to show some of the forms that I'd learned and, you know, obviously he was like, everything you've done is wrong. It's crap. It's of terrible. Stance is wrong. <laughs> <laughs> and how to align your shoulder with your hip and your, you know, your knee, your knee positions all out. And oh my goodness. Right away. Yeah. So what would you say like a typical day training with your teacher looked like? Um, so he had, <clears throat> he had like a public group where he'd teach. Uh, in the mornings in the park. Mm-hmm. And then I would often go in the afternoon and just train privately with him as well. So as far as in the park, it's, um, there was no sort of formal, like, it's not like, right, class begins from this time and runs till this time. You know, people just sort of rock up sort of any time between 5.30 and 6.30 a.m. People just gradually rock up. They stretch and warm up by themselves. And typically when there's enough people, we'd, we'd, uh, sort of get together and then we'd all run through the basics together, like the basic line drills and stances and stuff. Um, and then you just sort of break off and, and different people work on different things. And I think this is also um, where the whole question about sparring and stuff comes in, because I think the Western mentality is very much that like the teacher decides how the class goes. Right. And so we think a style has something or doesn't have something based on how the teacher runs the class. So we go, ah, oh, these guys aren't sparring. Therefore this style doesn't have sparring. But in China, it's very much just sort of like your training is your thing and your teacher's there to sort of guide you. So, you know, as I say, just going back to it, we, you know, after we've done our basics, everyone sort of breaks off and then, you know, maybe me and another guy, we might start to do a bit of sparring together teacher will come over and he'll be like, okay, you know, make sure you're doing this and doing that, protect your Mm. head here, you know, make sure to enter like this. Um, you know, if you maybe you decide to work on your forms and then he'll give you corrections on your movement and power and, and, you know, add some new moves into the forms or pretty much you just train what you want to train and he's there to like correct and guide you. 
That's really cool. So he's teaching you how to make your own soup. Teaching yeah. You how to basically. make yeah. yeah. And that's very much, you know, the, the, I think the traditional way. Um, and then training privately with him was quite similar. You know, I just sort of like, what do you want to work on? That was a lot more, or like question asking and stuff though. Yeah. Just going over one detail for an entire hour, you know, it's very much like the nitty gritty stuff. Mm -hmm. But a lot of Westerners get disheartened, I think, when they come to China and train, because that's why these big academies, like where I was at first, that's why I think they're quite good for Westerners, because they offer everything sort of um, in a very sort of well-packaged way, you know? Mm -hmm. Because, you know, a lot of these old masters, they don't want to stand there and just watch you do like 50 push-ups and then, you know, go for a run around the block and come back and, and do your stretching and everything. Like they're like, you do that in your own time. You know, don't waste my time. You're here to, to learn details. And a lot of people don't necessarily appreciate that you have to do all of that stuff by yourself outside of class. Right. Um, so, so that's a very different mentality, I think, to the West. Is there anything in all your travels and you've traveled in the mainland too and work with mantis practitioners there as well that you find to be somewhat unique? Would you be willing to share, share that with us that your teacher does in his Tai Chi mantis where you're like, I've looked around everywhere and that's kind of, kind of our little thing right there. If you don't Probably mind. Probably the sure. way we move. Yeah. I think the way we move, the, the, the power generation, a lot of people, think our movements are very weird looking because we have a lot of very big coiling and twisting movements and a lot of sort of offset like things. Um, and I think when people think it looks odd and they, I think they're misunderstanding the distance because it's not, it's not like, you know, we sort of stood quite far away and, you know, I'm just standing here and I'm blocking you here and I'm striking. The reason the body's moving in that way is because both our bodies are pretty much, you know, in. It's a, it's not a wrestling art, but it's a wrestling distance. Hmm. And so the reason you're moving your body like that is because you are, you know, right up against them with your shoulder or whatever, using your whole body to strike um, and to, you know, to throw them, to take them down. So I think I that's a quite unique thing about our way of uh, doing things. That's a t-shirt right there, by the way, not a wrestling art, but at a wrestling distance. Cause that, I'm like, <laughs> that is, that's it. That's, that's awesome. Really cool. I, to- I totally knew what you were talking about right there. I'm like, Oh, mm-hmm. that, that's really cool. That's really cool. As a, as a tea drinker myself, when are you, when are you going to bring back the tea chats, man? I do need to get onto those. I did. A while back, asked people for questions and I got a bunch of questions and I just got kind of sidetracked with other stuff. And yeah, I know I'm not the best person at keeping to a schedule, unfortunately. That's okay. That's okay. Um, Owen, do you have anything else you'd like to ask, Will? Um, you know, I was going to, uh, ask again a little bit more about, uh, the weapons training. And mm. so d- is the weapons training more, uh, so I know in some systems that I've said in the past, um, you know, weapons training is more about actually sort of using the weapon and, you know, more about practicing, uh, you know, actual like cuts and usage and in other systems that I've, I've been in, um, you know, the weapon was more of a, a training device to train the Shen Fa or to train a specific skill or like, you know, like a particular type of strength or ranges of motion. And I was wondering if there was any relation to that um, in, you know, any of the mantis systems that you've studied. Mm. Yeah. Um, look, I'll be completely honest here. Like um, my teacher's focus is more on the empty hand stuff. I know we kind of have this, this idea that like, you know, the teachers have to be, you know, complete experts in, in everything and they have to be all knowing and, and all skilled, but you know, the reality is people specialize on stuff and mm-hmm. my teacher is much more into the empty hand and the weapons for him are much more just like supplementary to it. Mm-hmm. So the way that we train, yeah, is more weapons are about, um, 
weapons are helping you develop your shenfa. I mean, particularly mm-hmm. when you look at, say, like the, the, the sword and the big spear and things, it's, you know, you're, it's teaching you how to move your body. Mm-hmm. Um, and sword trains your footwork very well as well. Um, so at least for him, that's more of the focus. Um, learning more weapon stuff is something I would like to do in future, though, definitely. Mm-hmm. Uh, I would like to take a real big deep dive into spear, particularly. Mm-hmm. I was just going to ask. That's so that's fascinating that you mm-hmm. said that because I was going to ask, what's your next martial journey? I'm hoping someday that maybe you lightly hit your head and fall in love with Wing Chun again because you've had a <laughs> you've had a lot of extensive. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I had to do that. I mean, you've had a lot of Wing Chun training under your belt, Will, and and you've said some pretty good things about certain gentlemen. Not so much in the in the Yip Man lineage, but there was a gentleman was at the Red boat guy. It was that guy that was like more shredded than a Julianne. Ah, uh, Young K San lineage. Uh, yeah, Lampin. yeah. He was um, awesome. Can't give any promises. I really don't know. But if I go to Hong Kong, I am going to try and uh, hook up with him again and see if I can get an actual interview with him. Because um, mm. he was he was great. I really enjoyed. I mean, I was only eighteen when I trained with him, and I was you know, fresh and and new to China. And that was my first time to to China and to Hong Kong as well. Um, But he was really, really great guy, uh, really open to teach. You're 18. That was only like six or seven years ago, wasn't that, brother? You being (laughs) being 18? You being 18? (laughs) No, 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 I'm 34. Happens quick. Well, I got a decade on you. Wait, what do you hit 44? That's when the magic starts. (laughs) That's when the magic starts. So... Well, besides Hong Kong, in the next few months, what's what's uh, Mon- Will from Monkey Steel's Peach up to? Um, like I say, there's a couple of guys down in Melbourne that I'd like to interview. Um, so I'm try and organize that. I I think my current focus, once I've got all the Taiwan stuff uh, finished, I've got one more video to edit. Uh, after that. I, I want to get back onto doing tutorials. Um, so I'm going to try and, uh, you know, get my head in gear and, and, and focus on doing some more tutorials. So that's going to be my next project. Um, but haven't really thought through exactly what I'm going to do just yet. One day at a time is just fine, my friend. One yeah. day at a time. No, I'm just going to ask, is there, you know, I know we're, 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 coming up on time. So uh, I just wanted to ask if there was anything else that you wanted to talk about or maybe promote or, you know, anything, um, anything like that. Um, let me think. Uh, we talked about Taiwan. We talked about jujitsu. Uh, yeah, I think, I don't know, really can't really think of anything unless you've got any other questions. Mm hmm. And your YouTube channel is Monkey Steals Peach. Yeah, correct. Yeah, yeah. yeah and it. if people and I know you have an Instagram account as well, so you know if people want to reach out, they want to get a hold of you. That that's that's. Is there a particular is Instagram good, or do you have an email address? Yeah, Instagram or website? is probably the best. Probably the best way to, to okay. contact me. Yeah. Cool. Oh, oh and well, thank the, you. Um, what's that? Thank Sorry? you, the Monkey Exits Cave. Thank you for dropping some new material there. Cause that was a lot of fun. I've been watching that as well. So, oh, that's actually the oldest videos from my monkey steals peach channel. Cause I just decided mm-hmm. to separate it out. That's actually something just, just mentioning that that's something that I do want to focus on a bit more as well. Um, I have a few ideas when I finally can get back to China. One thing that I want to do is, um, in the very far Northeast of China, there's an area called Yen Bien which is an ethnic Korea mm. area right on the border of North Korea. So it's often kind of called the third Korea. And hmm. the people there are Chinese citizens that are ethnically Korean uh, and their sort of their Korean culture is much closer to what North Korea would have been before. It's like a Stalinist mm. dictatorship. So wow. I really want to go and spend a bit of time exploring there. Um, I don't really Oh, we lock, we locked up. Well, any martial arts stuff there, but just as a sort of, yeah, for the second, it's what, sorry. 
Oh, we locked up on you. So, no, so you no, were no, saying, no. yeah. So, so you were saying you want to go there more for the ethnic and the culture, less on the martial side. Yeah, yeah, and 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 I'd like to film something about the the border with North Korea as well. I've got a bit of a fascination with borders. Um, yeah, I, so I, I saw that with Ma- Macau. Like that. Macau. Yeah, yeah mm-hmm. the the Macau border was very interesting. Or am I pronouncing yeah. that right? Yeah, Macau. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I really enjoyed that video too. Well, Will, thank you for your time. I hope you yeah. enjoy the rest of your day and. Thanks for spending uh, an hour with us, and hopefully we'll have you back on after your next adventure, maybe. Yeah, yeah, I look forward to that, and thank you for taking the time to to do this. I appreciate it. Mm-hmm. We yep. will we will put all the contact info when we put the show out in about a month, and also I'll get a hold of you about some of this stuff that we're we have over here that you were mentioning before the show. Yeah, please do. I appreciate cool. that. That'd be awesome. Yeah, you bet. Have Thanks a great so day, sir. Yeah. Yep. You guys too. Thank you.